welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I am your host today, Brian Broom, and I'm joined by Greg Uttinger, as usual, uh, where today we will be discussing the civil government, the character of leaders, what the requirements of leaders should be in their character, and uh, how justice and the fear of God even apply to the the civil realm. So, Greg, why don't you start us off? A few administrations back, there was a um, a question as to whether or not the character of the president of the United States really mattered as long as he was efficient, had a program and a vision and could get things accomplished. The fact that uh, sexual shenanigans might be going on in the White House was poo-pooed as irrelevant to the job description. Not everyone bought into this, but a lot of people did. A lot of people said, yeah, that's, I mean, we all got a problem. See, so he, you know, does stuff when we're not looking. But does that really make him a bad president? And we've we've had this kind of perspective in the United States for a long time. As far back as Tom Jefferson, and probably further, if you look up between the cracks, there's been the attitude that we should not acquire after people's private character, particularly their religious beliefs. Tom Jefferson was very incensed that people kept asking about his religious faith and his uh, doctrinal positions, largely because he had none. But even before that, Adams and, and Washington didn't come out in the open and tell us exactly what their creedal position was. These things were considered inappropriate for the public domain. Private character may forge the man, but his public decisions were not uh, of the same the same cloth. You could you could you could trust the man's character, but didn't have to, didn't inquire after his religion. Now you can't inquire after anything because character doesn't matter. Just his managerial ability, I guess you would say. David on his deathbed had a different opinion of this. This is from 2 Samuel 23. Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake unto me, he that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by a clear shining after rain. Although my house be not so with God, yet hath he made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire although he make it not to grow. Uh, David, and more to the point, God, said that rulers ought to be just. And just means righteous. Righteous means right according to God's moral standard revealed in Scripture, of which the voice of conscience and the uh, public acknowledgement of certain moral principles are at best a faint echo, but sometimes a little better than nothing. But the emphasis here is upon divine inspiration. His word was in my tongue. We're talking about verbal inspiration. The spirit of the Lord spake by me. And one of the things he said to this king was, he that rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Now, that's not how we look at things as Americans. We, uh, we expect our presidents at certain points to pull out the name of God, and make some reference to the Bible, and maybe the, the references used to be a whole lot stronger. Uh, as far back as the 50s, American presidents were still saying some pretty firm things that made it sound like you might actually be a Christian because you understand there's a connection between theology and, and morality uh, within the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years. We've gotten less and less of that. An acknowledgement to God, and when the Twin Towers are bombed, we all sing God bless America. But aside from that, just, you know, a, a brief acknowledgement that there's a God of some sort never to be defined and certainly never to be defined by a creed, that's, that's what we got. And that's not God's position. Well, and part of that has to do, I think, as well with the lessening spiritual and religious 
consciousness of the country Mm -hmm. being very explicitly Christian Mm -hmm. as it's, you know, developed in, in a more explicitly pluralistic way that has changed because you don't get elected if you don't appeal to the electors. Right. Which means you have to have some kind of little bit of religiousness or spirituality about you. But if you get too explicit, you're going to lose votes. Yep. And so even when we had a Mormon running for office a couple of elections back, he downplayed that wisely so from his point of view as a, as a potential candidate. He didn't come right out and say, you know, one key to my position is that someday I'm going to be God ruling over a planet, filling it with my spiritual children. That would have, that would have sunk it right there. Because most Christians don't even don't understand what Mormons believe, let alone the general public. Let alone a lot of Mormons. <laughs> yeah, of that too. Uh, it's ironic that a lot of Christians were looking at that man <clears throat> as a, possibly our last best hope. Because family values, right? We want character. So something of what we're talking about, I guess, tonight is the connection between public actions, policies, laws made, and such. The public character of a man, the private character of a man, and then the heart condition that produces that character. And it, uh, for, well, probably the length of America's existence, uh, we, we've had a hard time, particularly with that last one. It's enough to be a good man, to be a moral man, to be a stable man, to be a great statesman, a man of high character, of high ideals. But if you start inquiring too closely, what, what do you mean high ideals? Whose ideals would those be exactly? And yeah, family values. Well, the Mormons have some interesting family values. Mm-hmm. particularly before they settled in Utah. Um, what what are we talking about here? And do we dare get explicit? Or are we deliberately fogging things up and vaguing things up so that it sounds like we are all on the same page? But if you start asking too many questions, we begin to find out we're not nearly on the same page, that uh, who your God is actually determines what you consider good character. And not only privately, but publicly. Well, too, I think that there's there is an aspect to where you know the morals that you express, you you can look at them and say like these are these are good morals, and like the Christian knows why they're good morals. They're good morals because they reflect the moral character of God, who set them up, who, mm. who created the universe in such a way that this is how things function. But you can even you can get there, not salvifically, but to an extent by looking at how the world works and and recognizing that. And for people who are in it for things like power and authority, they would be stupid not to take account of how the world works and basically say, "Oh well, if I can mimic this, mm-hmm. I, I can get." A voting block that will support me because I will, I will be supporting the universe as these people have recognized it to be, and to a certain extent that can be in the short term, at the very least, uh, even even in the midterm. And I don't mean that as an election pun. <laughs> the middle length term, it can be beneficial to the nation, but it is certainly not one that can be, I think, lasting because mm-hmm. eventually the purpose behind it, the the things that sneak out at the seams mm. start to undermine the very benefits that they have noticed um, and, and start to deprive the nation itself of the moral character that it, it, that it had. Uh, something that comes to mind along those lines is the case of Ahab in the Old Testament. God sends Elijah to him and says, you're dead. Enough of this nonsense. I'm through with you. And Ahab, rather than throwing a temper tantrum, humbles himself. He puts on sackcloth. He goes softly, we're told. He submits himself to the outward forms of repentance. Now, from what follows, it's pretty clear he hasn't repented. He has not done away with his idolatries. He hasn't changed his political policies particularly. But in terms of how he presents himself to those about him, to the public eye, 
he has taken this rebuke to heart, so it seems. <clears throat> God, who knows all things, looks at him and looks at Elijah and says, see how he's going softly? Because of that, I'm not going to do all this nasty stuff in his generation. I'm going to do it to his son. Now, God didn't promise how long or soon that would be. It turns out <laughs> it wasn't very long, but it was nevertheless a temporal, temporary blessing, an act of patience and outward grace on God's part mm. to not make him go through the humiliations of, say, palace coup or military defeat or horrible deeds or any such thing. He did die in battle. He died very quickly. He actually died rather valiantly. Now, what he met on the other side when he had to stand before God is something completely different. But God wasn't deceived as to the man's integrity or what he really believed. He knew that Ahab was not a fear of God, but he honored the external submission to his order. And I think that's something we can trace carefully throughout Scripture. We should not pursue honesty because it's the best policy but rather because God is holy and true and and transparent to himself. As it happens, honesty is the best policy. <laughs> it actually is. But to pursue it as a policy because it's a policy, because it may bear politically or economically, financially good fruit, is not the fear of God. And yet God tends to honor people who behave honestly. People respect them, trust their judgment, buy their product. When people even outwardly give some kind of heed to God's law order, God, to some measure, will honor that in return. Is it saving? Absolutely not. Uh, and there can be the lull of, oh, look, I am... I have a happy family. I'm at peace. The nation's at peace. We're getting wealthy. God must really love us. Yeah, no, that's not what's... Uh, no. Uh, and yet it's a thing. It, it is a real thing. And so yeah. to have in office men who do not lie for whatever reason is better than men who lie as a matter of policy all the time. <laughs> uh, men who are faithful to their wives are better leaders than those who cheat and visit prostitutes all the time. And we can go down the list. Those who externally conform to God's law do make better leaders than those who don't. And yet what David says is not merely it's great if you are outwardly righteous and just, although there's truth in that. But he says that he that rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Now, that's a hard attitude. And ideally, the, the public leader that we should want, that godly people should want, is someone who is, in fact, godly. Someone who loves the Lord, fears God, in the sense of being afraid of displeasing him, fearful as one stands in awe of something that is great power and uh, who messing with might cause great disaster. Uh, it's uh, John Gill in his uh, commentary on this speaks of this fear as filial fear, a reverential affection and devotion. The, the truly just man serves and honors God from the heart because God ought to be honored, because he is God, because he is the creator, and because he is the just man's savior. He has made him indeed truly just and righteous through the blood of Christ, through the gospel. Uh, and, and, and so this is, this is the Bible's point. Any degree of, of morality is better than none. But there is a real serious difference between those who observe the forms of godly morality for reasons other than the fear of God and those whose true character grows out of a true fear of God, a transformed heart, a born-again nature. Uh, and, and as Christians, we need, to, we need to understand that. We need to not blur the boundary. We can, we can look and say, all right, well, all right, you're, you, you're, you're a Mormon. You're a Muslim. You're a Jew. You, but you, you take your faith seriously and understand these religious commitments to the degree that you, on principle, will not lie. Okay, we can work with that. We can honor that. We can respect that. Because whether you understand it or not, you are mirroring, to some degree, what the God of the universe demands. And it, it, and it's a good policy. It works better than the other. It's closer to what God wants, and God will honor and bless it in some measure. However, it's not the same thing as having a godly man on the throne, or in the White House, or at number 10 Downing Street. God, we are Christians, we need to understand that we don't simply need good men or conservative men, 
or libertarian men or free market men. We need men who love Jesus, men who are trusting in his word. I, this random side note, I uh, picked up a book called, uh, let's pick it up in the sense of literally picked it up off my shelf. I actually put, picked it up off my desk because I put it on my shelf earlier to look at it, to look at some uh, ancient ideas on ancient. Mm. Older ideas about conspiracy theory. And I opened it and I found the book was dedicated, it was written by a Roman Catholic priest. And it was dedicated to all godly men and those who, because they have the remnants of natural law written in their heart, are on our side. Okay, I kind of understand what you're doing there, but that's a huge confusion of categories. Um, you're, you're basically saying there's a great evil out there, this, this horrible evil, all control of conspiracy, and over against it are Christians and all non-Christians who act like Christians, sort of. That's not the line the gospel draws through history. You're either with Christ or you're against Christ. You either believe in Christ or you hate Christ. And as long as we blur that, conspiracies and secret societies and political corruptions and collusion, they're going to continue to happen. And the defense is the gospel. The defense is not compromise on some moral externals. Uh, it's not a sort of moral fundamentalism of let's create a list of 10 things that we all, all of us good people can agree on, no matter what our, um, our religious background may be. Again, recognizing that some people's principles are better than other people's. We were talking about, I'm, I'm going to throw this at you and let you talk about this and see, see what you have to say. We were talking about Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. whom I know you and Emily both have great respect for. I, I, I do not, not have respect for him. I just haven't read his stuff. So you are the better person to speak here. Um, how would you see him falling into this conversation? I would define Jordan Peterson as at least as far as his popularity, mm -hmm. the preeminent example of natural law knowledge. Mm -hmm. And essentially, he has observed the world. And he's observed it for long enough that he knows how he has recognized many of the ways in which God's universe works, because mm -hmm. it's God's universe. Yeah. He doesn't acknowledge that in Christian terms, or even in Judeo-Christian terms, whatever mm. that term means. And and I I do, just for clarity, I do fall a bit more favorably on the uh, the natural law view, but he, he's someone who, who understands how God's world works. Mm -hmm. And he's gotten to this point that he that he's at through you know, decades of of observation and study and work with human other human beings. Mm -hmm. And what is really important to to distinguish as a, as a good Presbyterian, I have to distinguish things, mm -hmm. is that whatever your beliefs on natural law are, it is not something that is salvific. And that right. is what we currently are seeing in the case of Jordan Peterson, which is very sad, is that he remains unconvinced of mm -hmm. the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. He has seen everything, uh, not everything, you know what I mean, a, a very large chunk of what the universe is, and it is screaming at him that God exists, mm -hmm. that his laws govern the world. He looks at he did like a um lecture series uh i don't know if he finished it or what but he, he went through the bible and talked about it from his perspective and like mm. which is thoroughly jungian so it's it's not a christian exegesis of the bible but it still even brings out some very interesting insights that mm -hmm. maybe you would not have thought of yourself you know mm -hmm. and he's still he's still not there it is a case study to a certain extent of how faith is still a gift at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yes, um, as, as far as the discussion of, you know, private character, public character, just rulers, you know, Jordan Peterson, I mean, he's Canadian, he couldn't run for president, but <laughs> you know, 
uh, in the hypothetical situation where he was running for president against uh, an individual who was a you know a PC USA minister who uh, recently yeah. baptized someone's dog into the church. <laughs> yeah. He'd be a better choice because he's more in tune with how God's universe works, mm-hmm. even if that does not reflect in his eternal state. Yeah. Or at least how his eternal state appears, appears to be at present. Moment. Yeah. Yeah. We, of course, are praying for him to see the light, just as we are honestly praying for everyone, including the PCUSA minister <laughs> who baptized, <laughs> baptized the, dog the dog into the yeah. church recently. Well, but I'd like to pursue the, the next section because it, with all due respect to our libertarian friends, and again, yes, we, we have libertarian leanings here, undoubtedly. We... You know, we don't trust the state further than we can throw it generally. And God's law hymns it in on all sides. And yet, David does say this, speaking of the just man who rules in the fear of God. He shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, and as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Highly metaphorical and poetic, but the idea is that a godly ruler can accomplish much good. The libertarian approach, and, and also in some regards the Lutheran approach, is to, if we acknowledge civil government at all, is to acknowledge it as more or less as God's hangman or the policeman or the jailkeeper, the, the guy who's there with the stick to to lock down people who are obviously lawbreakers or criminals who are a threat to society. And that's there's disagreement of truth in that. But David goes beyond that to say that kings... And he's talking in terms of monarchy, so that we're not, well, we don't have a monarchy. That's, well, we don't call it a monarchy. <clears throat> when the president starts giving executive orders, it has the force of law, that's questionable. But uh, the, the idea that a political leader, a civil leader, a, a magistrate, a king even, can be a force for good is something we've kind of lost. Uh, possibly because it's been a while since we've had a really clear example. Um, Calvin Coolidge. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few here and there, even even in American history. You usually recognize them among American presidents because nothing bad or good happened in their administration. They backed off and stayed out of the way and let the country do its thing and only got involved when there was some kind of crisis. People who the presidents who had to constantly having programs that fixed and changed everything usually were the problem. But going back in British history, and I'll, I'll, I'll skip over a lot of people that you could argue for and go first to Edward the Sixth, and then to Alfred. Mm-hmm. Edward the Sixth, as a young man, made a numerous uh, liturgical religious changes within his kingdom. Now, you can argue, well, king shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, well, at that point, kings did. So <laughs> simply saying, I refuse to be involved, would, would itself be an act of being involved. He is the one who sponsored the prayer book, the 39 articles, or what would eventually become 39 articles. They were 42 at the time. And he reintroduced or made, made legal again evangelical preaching in England. This had a profound effect on the character of the nation. England would be in a very different place today. The United Kingdom would be a very different place if ever it hadn't been there. But going back further to Alfred the Great, there's a reason he gets, he's the only king who gets the title of the Great. He fought back uh, the Vikings by coming up with some very original military strategy and naval strategy. He solidified the economy by introducing solid silver coinage that everybody wanted, including people on the continent. He uh, introduced education, first of all, to nobles to the point of saying, you will either learn to read or if, you're, if you want to plead that you're too old and, and, and too enabled, then you have to hire some guy, pay some guy to walk around you reading books out loud to you all day. Uh, he uh, introduced Powell's schools. He tr- began a translation program and he was part of one of the translators who t- started turning every book that they could find that Christendom valued at that time into Anglo-Saxon. Some of it existed in Latin, but no one read Latin anymore. Um, so into the language of the people and, and, and including, of course, the Bible. And so that set a pattern for translating the Bible into 
English, although it's in English we can't read anymore. That's just that's just the surface of the stuff he did. And he did this as a young man who was beset by some horrible illnesses that racked him with pain on a constant basis, enemies all around him, uh, nobles that at least on one occasion seemed to have stabbed him in the back and helped with his exile. And yet his faith was always in God. And so as you read what he wrote, it is clear that this is not a, I'm a great guy and I'm going to do great things. It's God has called me and he's called England to our roots, to our Christian heritage, to the covenant our fathers made with the God of Israel. We have to be faithful. We don't have an option here. And it doesn't matter what it costs me. And uh, the what follows in British history uh, owes a lot to this young man, or grew up to be an older man. Kings and rulers and presidents, uh, both in their official capacity and in their uh, personal lives, can do great good. They 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 have the public eye, they have a voice that reaches the public ear. They generally are fairly well off. At least they're probably not working three side jobs in McDonald's at that to keep things going. So they have some time on their hands. They know people, they have contacts. Even if you don't write anything in your constitution that says they can do X, Y, and Z, they can still do A, B, and C because of all those advantages. And if they have a godly character, then that can be a tremendous advantage to this generation and to those that follow. And that's sort of what David is saying here, like a light in the morning, like the tender grass springing up after the dew. They can be dew and rain and sunlight to a culture. But it takes some commitment, and it takes a little going beyond playing by the political rules and giving your heart to God. Now, in saying these things, David is not himself becoming a statist. He knows that he knew better than anybody else that kings have their problems because he was a king and he had committed murder and adultery while in office. In fact, to some degree, he used not only his office, but his role as Messiah to um, seduce Bathsheba. And so he does say, uh, although my house be not so with God. Uh, the commentators, when they come to the, this, this verse 5, are, are divided as to the proper translation. Uh, and the question is the first clause and the last clause. Although my house be not so with God, and at the end, um, although he make it not to grow. And the question is, are these statements or conditionals, or are they questions? And a, a number of commentators, even some really good ones, went for, well, this, this is actually an assertion. Uh, my house is so, is not my house so with God? For he has made a covenant with me. Wait, David knew better than to think that God's covenant with him was based upon the character, his own character, or the character of his kids. He would, I, I think there you have to have it as a statement, although my house be not so with God. Yeah, this is what a just king should be. I failed. And when the man after God's own heart, one of the greatest kings in the history of the world can say, I failed, we need to take that seriously. And then he turns to the promise of God's covenant. The thing at the end, I think we can leave possibly as a question. Although, will he not make it to grow? And at the heart of that is, he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. Uh, dispensationalism, particularly the old Scofieldian version, tended to turn the covenant with David into a political arrangement whereby Israel would rule the world through her Messiah. And it was all about some land, it was all about an earthly throne, it was all about political rule and externals and all of that. <clears throat> but when David wants to talk about salvation, he points to this covenant. Mm. It's everlasting. It's not just for a millennium or for some limited time here on earth. It is sure, and he says, it is all my salvation. So he understands that the covenant that God has made with him is a covenant of grace. It is a matter of God's sovereign mercy no no human merit here, and that it does, it, it, its goal is his salvation, the salvation of the world. And there are echoes of this whole thing in Psalm 72. I'm going to read just a few verses here and there, because this is, this is what David ultimately is looking at. Yeah, good human rulers, great. There aren't many, and most of them will fail. But speaking of Messiah, he shall judge the poor, 
of the people and shall save the children of the needy. Shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass. Sound familiar? As showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish in abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. For he shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him for he shall deliver the needy when he crieth. The poor also and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and the needy and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence and precious shall their blood be in his sight. So the ultimate king is very much a king who is not going to be merely a necessary evil. He is the end and purpose of God's necessary good. We need a king. Remember the, the, the child's catechism? Why do you need Jesus as a king? Because I am weak. Mm. can say so much more, but that's not a bad, bad starting point. We need someone to save and protect us, to defend us against our own sins, the world of flesh and the devil, and someone to lead us on to glory, someone to protect us, rule over us, and guide us. And so we, we need to get away from the idea that kings in and of themselves, or political rulers or magistrates in and of themselves, are merely an evil we have to put up with. Mm. But they can be a force for good because the most important one in the history of eternity is most certainly a good one. And yeah. He's the one that political rulers should seek to be like, but a mere outward conformity to a few rules isn't going to do it. You have to kiss the sun. You have to bow before the Messiah. You have to trust Jesus. You have to believe the gospel. And that was uh, a, a point I was going to bring up before you said it uh, oh, at okay. the end there, uh, which is that if, Jesus is a king and the king and his rule is just and good. That means that the very existence of a king is not something that is wrong with the world. Mm -hmm. It's a, perhaps an accommodation to the fall. And even then, I don't think that that's the right way to think about it, but mm -hmm. it is good it's a good thing we 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 have a good and perfect king coming but that doesn't mean that in the meantime every king is going to be like the worst and yeah. not a good uh setup and of course when i say king i don't just mean people in a monarchy but <laughs> presidents and prime ministers and elected senators and and things like that these are people who are able to rule in their respective capacities and in their respective territories mm -hmm. in a way that is honoring to God and helpful as well to their citizens. It's not, it's not a foregone conclusion that their very existence is a, uh, a threat to mm -hmm. the safety and security of their citizens. Yeah. 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 Which is one reason I can never, ever go into the far, far right corner of the political alignment square yeah. <laughs> uh, towards anarcho-capitalism. Right. Because they essentially say there is no king but Christ, and therefore any authority is is some kind of imposition on us. And it's it doesn't work that way. I, and, and you know, some uh, a memory comes back to me from my college years. I was talking to a young man who was new to the faith and was still learning and trying hard and tried to be gracious to him. But he he knew that there were these bad guys out there in government and such and um, just saw that as all evil. But praise God, in eternity, there will be no kings, no rule, we'll all be equal. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, is it? no. <laughs> it's not <laughs> exactly what the Bible says. It is, we're not told heaven's a democracy. Um <laughs> the, 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 the words are, be thou ruler over five cities. Thou shalt be ruler over many things. There will still be responsibilities and areas of authority. But the young man said, but, but why? We won't need it. We won't sin anymore. We don't need anyone to tell us what to do when we don't sin. Well, we won't need <laughs> civil punishment anymore. We don't but need that civil doesn't mean punishment. that civil rulership is still. <laughs> 
Yeah, leading, like, leading is not the same thing as having to punish wickedness. Sometimes you just have to know when, what time do we get there and who's doing what and what time do we clock out? Uh, <laughs> or something simple like, it's heaven. Which side of the road are we going to drive on now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's heaven. It's amazing and mystical enough that uh, you can drive on whichever side of the road you want and it still works yeah no it's it's yeah. <laughs> even in eternity there will be left a and need. right I know. yeah <laughs> there's still left and right yeah there's, there's still a need for direction leadership deciding which way we turn on on what color light whatever it may be and when we have within ourselves or since within ourselves developing that kind of spirit that says Basically, no one gets to tell me what to do, but, well, God. That's not the way God has ever set up humanity. No, he's society. always worked through mediators. Yeah. And now we have the great mediator, but even, even with Christ in his mediatorial role, even, well, now on earth we have church leadership, yeah. which hopefully these people are submitting to. One um, hopes. And and yeah. he still delights to use the language, you are kings and priests to God. Now, if kingship wasn't itself an evil thing, that wouldn't be a great metaphor. No. Oh. Um, and, and, you know, in the last day, will there be kings to cast their crowns at Jesus' feet? Or will there only be anarcho-capitalists? throwing their money at Jesus, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it's something less than an honor to not be honored by powerful people. Mm. If all you have are everybody's equal, that's, that's there's something lacking, something that's, that God has built into the human soul that says some people deserve more respect than others. Some people need to be listened to more than others. Some people need to be followed more than others. And when those people point at the same Lamb of God and say, we worship him. Yeah. That's honor upon honor. And that is that is the way the Bible presents it. In, in, in the New Jerusalem, the kings of the earth bring their, their glory and honor into the city. It doesn't say, and be, oh, it'll be great, there'll be no more kings. No, they'll just be in submission to Christ. And that's the call of Psalm 2. He tells the judges of the earth to kiss the sun. Be wise, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and he perish from away. He just doesn't say, you know what? You're all out of office. I unelect you. Go away. Yeah. He wants them still in office. He just wants them obedient. And so yeah. this. Uh, he does not say there are there should be no men ruling over other men because the whole idea is terrible and came out of hell. Rather, he says... <laughs> That such men need to be just, they need to be righteous, they need to fear God. Yeah. And when they do, God can use that as a great way of blessing. Exactly. And also uh, to, I guess, kind of transition to a similar but related point, we, we've, we've mentioned the fact that we don't need to say, well, no one on the ballot, met mm -hmm. in this case metaphorically, is just is yeah. righteous so do we just not vote no there are some christians who do that or they pick some candidate who cannot possibly win and of course their comeback is no all things are possible with god yes but <laughs> exactly yeah i mean <laughs> and and to the pacific ocean could come and wash away america tomorrow i don't think it's likely Ah. And there are certain candidates who are not going to get elected. I'm sorry. It's very uh, true. I mean, yes, there we can. But if only all Christians, if all Christians thought like that, we'd never elect anyone. Well, okay. But uh, can That's we fair. at least get somebody godly up there who has some experience? Maybe some experience. Well, let's start him as a dog catcher and a uh, maybe a city councilman and then a county supervisor and then... Uh, state legislature, let's work him up the chain and get him some experience. Well, but that takes some time. We need someone right now. We'll turn the world around. Yes, yeah, see, that's the problem. That is the problem. And it's also a problem when, uh, for instance, you have to, uh, you know, in, in most cases, when we're talking about America at the very least and elections, it comes down to two. Like, yeah. you, you're, you're talking. To, that's the way the system works. You're talking Democrat and Republican. And. 
if both of them are evil, there is a temptation. And we've seen it in a lot of different elections, not just in the past 20 years, yeah. where you basically say, well, this guy is on our side, so he must be God's man. Yeah. And that is really not the way to ever look at someone. <laughs> no. Uh, unless you have actual reason to presume that. <laughs> no. And even if he even if he is a born again Christian, but young in his faith and hasn't figured out the political implications yet, still doesn't mean he's gonna make a particularly great president. Exactly. He sometimes can do more good than evil in his uh, enthusiasm. We're told that a you mean man more should not evil be, than good. Yeah, we're told that a man should not be an elder if he's a novice. Well, what if there's no one in the church but novices because we've just suffered great persecution? What do you do then? The answers are not always easy, and it, it, it doesn't help to pretend they are. Yeah. But sometimes, and, and this is in the original article I wrote for this, I said the bottom line is this: when we when we're when all choices seem morally bad. There's still a question we can ask. Who's most likely to leave the church alone? Mm. Who's going to let the church do her job? For whatever reason, because he doesn't care, because it's not his thing, because he got enough votes from that side to be nice to them, whatever, as opposed to the guy who's going to come in and try to shut us down and throw us in prison. If that's all we got, then that's all we got. Paul instructed us to pray for those in authority so that we might lead quiet, peaceable lives in all honesty and godliness before him. And when all is said and done, if we can't get anything else, we can at least try for that one. If we can pray for it, presumably we can vote for it. Uh, and we can realize this is God. This is not your guy. He's not born again. He doesn't fear you. But compared to the other guy, it looks like he'll probably leave us alone and that'll buy us four more years, eight more years mm -hmm. to preach a gospel without being harassed. And right now, looking over what's happened in this country in the last four years, the last two years particularly, sometimes we think, you know, that'd be a good deal. Someone who would not try to shut down the churches, let's say. Yes. And I don't want to let it pass without saying at least this much is that, um, you know, there are Christians who have softer consciences about sure, voting for people. So we're not saying that if you didn't vote for one of the two that could conceivably win that you are in sin or anything like that. Because then I'd be saying I was in sin this election, <laughs> and that's a, that's a yeah. weird take to, to yeah, walk away I was, from. I was in sin for a number of elections when I was quite young. <laughs> um, but we, I think, what we're saying is there is a danger of us of a political legalism here, mm -hmm. where you draw the categories too tightly. Daniel didn't get a choice as to whether or not he worked for Nebuchadnezzar. Well, he kind of did. He could have got himself killed if he tried a little harder. Joseph kind of had a choice to work for Pharaoh. He could have refused God's prophecy and refused to help Egypt, but that there was no sense in that. And so these people got drafted in positions of high authority where in times they were virtually running things. Yep. Uh, and God used them. God honored that, even though the men they work for were not godly at all, at least in the beginning. They may have been converted along the way. Pharaoh seems to have honored Jacob and received a blessing from him. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar eventually was converted, but it took a long while Yeah, after he had destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and all that. So th there is a danger in saying, unless my guy, the guy I'm going to vote for, unless he's a card-carrying Presbyterian baptized by sprinkling <laughs> <laughs> after a covenant little format and subscribes to all five points, and verbatim subscription to the Westminster Confession, including the six day clause. Um, can't vote for him, can't support him, can't be in his, can't, can't be in his uh, cabinet. And, you know, yeah. yeah, you can. You can. And if you haven't thought through that, maybe this would be a good time to, it's to great. consider. It's great you mentioned that because I was just racking my brain earlier and I, I had to Google it and I found it. The the name of the, the branch of the Covenanters that yeah. like don't acknowledge the validity of um non-covenanted um nations they, yeah. they don't recognize their authority as legitimate at all they're called cameronians <laughs> and oh, it's yeah. I've heard that almost like that it's yeah. almost it, it it's uh not quite as intense as that i think but it is very much a if uh 
you can't even serve in a nation. You can't do anything. You can't like those people don't have a legitimate authority over you at all because they are not covenanted as a nation with God. And yeah. and I that, think what our I think what our friends misunderstand there is the sovereign. It's just an interesting thing to accuse Presbyterians of. They don't yeah. understand the sovereignty of God. Christ is King. Uh, and rules the world by covenant, whether we like it or not. <laughs> we don't get a vote here. I mean, that's as, as good Pado Baptists, they should get this. You don't get a vote whether or not you're in covenant with God. God grabs you, takes you, and tells you his terms, and you submit or you don't. Jesus owns the world yep. by covenant. Anyway, that's a side issue that we will come up with many, many times, particularly in the book of Kings, when we start talking a little more about. Um, how covenant should affect uh, national life. No, I'm sure. I think that's a good place to cut it then. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for joining me to talk about these things. Do you want to, mm -hmm. do you have a recommendation? Uh, yeah, it, it would be nice if I had something terribly <laughs> ap applicable, um, um, but I'm going to go off into um, something I'm simply surrounded in right now, which is Shakespeare. People should read Shakespeare, but not read. If Shakespeare wasn't written to be read. People should go to plays that are performed by at least halfway competent actors or watch them on video and immerse themselves in the language and the imagery and the thought form and yeah. the hilarity and the um, craziness that is Shakespeare. We're producing Midsummer Night's Dream right now. And it is, it's fun to watch the very language seep into the pores of the students <laughs> until it begins coming out in just the oddest way. I know in our family for years now, when we're trying to get someone to go out the door or continue in their conversation, we will say, proceed, Moon, <laughs> which is, <laughs> this is a line from What You Do About Nothing. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it, it helps process the world. Shakespeare was a Christian, as far as we can measure such things. And he certainly thought in Christian thought uh, and And his grand view of the universe, his language, his word choice, gives you the ability to categorize things in a new and helpful way that's a little bit bigger than what you may have picked up in high school or your junior college or even your four-year university, uh, more than you will get in the technical manuals and the economic and political language you find in your uh, your business emails. Uh, and, and even more colorful and and extended than some of theology, unless, of course, you read the Psalms and Job a lot, or Isaiah. It's, it, it is a useful thing, but it takes, but people, if you've never done it, it takes time, and you need to find some good versions of the plays, and that's hard. And I can think of... Uh, Kenneth Branagh's Henry V and Much Ado About Nothing, but I can't recommend everything that he's done. No. Uh, Mel Gibson's Hamlet was pretty good. Was it? Sure, really? Yeah. yeah. That's he stayed surprising pretty, me. He stayed pretty close to the original script, just moved a few things around historically. And of course, you always drop things because it's a three hour play otherwise. But he played it traditionally. He did, he did a, a fine job with it. And That's I'm awesome. sure there are other things other people could add. Uh, but this, this is a. <laughs> This is not a mere entertainment the way one watches uh, a Netflix original production. This is a way of learning to think about life because, as my wife has said so many times, the way you talk about something is how you think about it. Mm -hmm. And when you learn phrases drawn out of Christian thought forms and they become your way of expression, it will change how you perceive what's going on. Yes, my daughter is as brilliant as the moon as she steps toward the doorway and proceeds out. There's things to be considered there. So anyway, that's my my thought for today. Uh, related to that, um, I would also suggest a a humorous. I've only I've only actually watched one clip from it, so I recommend the clip at the very least. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but there's a production of Much Ado About Nothing where Benedict and Beatrice are played respectively by David Tennant and Catherine Tate. Who, oh. <laughs> if you don't know the second person's name uh, and are familiar with Doctor Who, that's Donna Noble. So, like yeah. the best doctor and companion pairing in the new series of Who, in my opinion, mm. um, and also the universe's opinion. But anyway, um, <laughs> the universe having a voice at all. It does. Uh, <laughs> it is speaking through me. <laughs> 
No, uh, Shakespearean. Actually, there's a place up here uh, about two hours north of us um, that does Shakespeare in the Park that we are mm. planning to go witness in person this uh, this summer. So that'll be fun. Oh, and by the way, David Tennant does an excellent Hamlet as well. Oh, that's right. I need to watch that. Yeah. Ah, uh, I don't know where to find it. The anyway. internet, like everything else. <laughs> well, it's it's a matter of where could I find it that won't mean paying a lot for it. Oh, that yeah. <laughs> uh, so, for my recommendation, I am going to recommend uh, a. <laughs> it is somewhat. It is somewhat a tongue in cheek reference, and it is. It falls very, very far short of the quality of Hamlet, of uh, of anything by Shakespeare, for that matter. But uh, there is a BBC series that started in 2008, and that is part of the reason I'm recommending it, because the CG is is entertainment in and of itself for how <laughs> bad it is. Uh, and it's, the, it's a BBC show called Merlin. And basically the idea behind it was, what if we followed the path of Merlin and how he influences a young Ar- a King Arthur, but they're all also like young, like they're it's Merlin and Arthur, but they're young. And sometimes you, you also just have to laugh at the logical leaps and the blindness because one of the things is Uther Pendragon hates magic and puts sorcerers to death in his kingdom if he oh. finds them. And so Mark Merlin has to keep his magic a secret from everyone, including <laughs> Arthur. And sometimes he will literally do it in front of Arthur and Arthur will miss it because Arthur is kind of dumb. He's a job. <laughs> So it it's it's a it's season one. Season ones are always rough, you know, yeah, yeah, in yeah. a variety of ways. So we just started season two, and I <laughs> I watched this years ago, and I know it gets at least enjoyable to watch, and not this kind of level that it's at now. But I can recommend it now for the humor factor. It is <laughs> really funny to watch uh, from the like. It's it's almost like. If you know Mystery Science Theater three thousand, yeah, like you yeah. can just make fun of it the whole way through, and it's it's a grand old time. Because it's making fun of things. Along it is, way. and it's you know yeah. maybe it get maybe it gets better later, or maybe I've completely uh, put rose colored glasses on the later <laughs> seasons. But anyway, I'll, I'll recommend Merlin. It's mm-hmm. fun. There, it, there's ridiculousness in it, and it's lighthearted fun. Okay. Well. Thank you again for joining me for this, Greg. It was a pleasure mm-hmm. talking about it with you. To our loyal, happy listeners, you would like to follow us if you don't already. I will make this a Jedi mind trick. <laughs> you can follow us on YouTube, on Rumble. You can follow our Facebook, and you can listen and subscribe to the podcast on any podcast catcher uh, that's out there. We're on all of them, as far as we're aware. If you find one that we're not on, please send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com and let us know. Uh, You can ask questions of us that we will happily cover on the show. Drop us a note, let us know you like us, or if you have any suggestions for topics for us to cover, we would... I think we'd greatly appreciate that. Uh, If you would like to support us financially, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. That really helps us with um, affording all the software that we use to edit the episodes and get them out to you on a speedy time frame. And if you do financially support us, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate that uh, you are investing in this and investing in the the time and work that we're, we're doing to bring this kind of content to you. And we will see you next time. Thank you again for joining us. Bye.